All right. Welcome once again. Um, Una Daly here from the Community College Consortium for OER, and happy Open Education Week. Can everyone hear me okay out there? Great. Thanks, Jackie and Regina. Um, so today we have um, a webinar on OER adoption to scale and highlights from four states. So we have some very special speakers today who are going to share with you um, projects of several years standing. Um, I think they vary from about two years through about six years um, of OER project development. So you're in for a real treat in hearing um, lessons learned and, um, and um, the benefits that their institutions have received through OER. And Today we want to thank the California Community College System, which provides us with our Blackboard Collaborate system. I think most of you are familiar with it. Um, we're going to um, hold all of the questions. Uh, I should say we're going to hold the audio questions till the end. Please use the chat window, uh, which is, should be on the left-hand side under the participants window, for comments and questions as you go along. We'll do our best to answer those um, during the webinar. Um, we'll hold sort of the main Q&A at the end, but uh, please uh, put those in as we go along and let us know what you're, um, what you're thinking. So as I mentioned earlier, it's Open Education Week, which is a, a animation that the um, Open Education Consortium, our parent organization, sponsors. Um, and it's a worldwide celebration to raise awareness about free and open educational opportunities that exist for everyone everywhere right now. And there's hundreds of um, online and local events that are posted up there um, that you can attend this week from around the world. Um, some in um, different languages, which are kind of fun to attend, but even though you may not be able to understand all of it. Um, and then there's wonderful videos and project showcases that are up there as well. So definitely um, get up there when you can and, and share it with your colleagues. And feel free to, uh, if you yourself have posted things in the Open Education Week site, uh, feel free to put that in the chat window to share that with others. So today um, I'm going to we're going to do a really brief overview of CCC OER as we always do, our little uh, advertisement. And then um, we're going to get right into those highlights from the four states, from Arizona, California, Washington, and Virginia. And let's see, see who the speakers are. So this morning we have Preston Davis, who is the Director of Instructional Services at the Extended Learning Institute at Nova Community College in Virginia. Um, and Preston is going to be presenting on the OER-based uh, degree, uh, two degrees that they have um, developed there at um, ELI. Um, I hope I said that correctly, Preston. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. We'll hear more from Preston shortly. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce Paul Golish, uh, the CIO and Dean of Information Technology at Paradise Valley College in Arizona. And Paul is going to tell us about um, the Maricopa Millions Project, which is a project, um, an OER project, that spans their entire district of Maricopa, um, which is 10 colleges. Um, they are the largest community college district in the United States, and they've been running this program um, for three years now. And we're going to hear that they've already met their goals for their first five years within, um, within three years. Uh, next up is going to be Richard Sebastian. Um, he is the Director of Teaching and Learning Technologies at the Virginia Community College System. And he is going to tell us about the statewide Z23 program. Um, and, and next is Quill West, who is the manager of the Open Education Project at Pierce College District in Washington. Uh, also a longtime uh, member of CCCOER, as all of these folks are. And Quill is our president of the CCCOER board. And she is going to tell us about the Pierce Open Pathways program that has been running now. It's in its second year, which is a full OER-based path. And finally, uh, James Lava-Grosskrag is joining us. He is the Dean of Educational Technology Learning Resources 
at distance learning at College of the Canyon. And I think uh, many of you know James. He was our past president of CCC OER and is the OEC president uh, this year. And James is going to tell us about the many projects that are happening at College of the Canyons around OER that have been going on for five or six years now. Um, and they've just recently um, started working in the last year on a OER pathway that he's going to share with us uh, later on. All right. I think um, probably many of you are familiar with the Community College Consortium for OER. Uh, our mission is expanding access to high quality open educational resources for both faculty and students. And we do this through um, supporting faculty in professional development um, and providing them and um, the other staff and faculty who work with them um, with the best around open educational resources. As you know, we do many webinars around finding high quality OER and we often have faculty with us here on these webinars as well speaking about their perspective of how they adopt it. And finally, this is all about improving success, um, providing access for students, and helping them to complete their degrees in a timely fashion. We're in 21 states and provinces, and um, we would love to have you join us if you're not a member uh, and help us make this a sustainable effort um, going forward. All right, now to the uh, important part of our um, webinar, which is um, the OER adoption to scale. And I'm going to let my speakers, my five wonderful speakers here, tell you about their projects. Um, but in thinking about um, some of the considerations where they have found success over the years, all of these are multi-year projects, as I mentioned, from two to six years. Um, in, in standing. So they have been working on this for a while. It didn't happen overnight. Uh, there were faculty champions involved um, who were who went out there and found the OER and created OER. Uh, there was administrative support in most cases, um, maybe not initially, but um, there was administrative support over the long haul to really make this happen, which is a really key piece. And then in many cases, there has been open education policies at their college or their district or their state now um, to support open education. And that also is really critical to the long-term sustainability of these projects. So without further ado, I am going to turn this over to Paul Golish uh, from Paradise Valley College. He's going to tell us about the Maricopa Millions project. Thanks, Una. Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, Una, do I need to be bumped up to be able to advance? Oh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> uh, let me get down here, Paul. Um, thank you, as Paul. Um, and as we're getting started, uh, I'll just let you know I'm from the Maricopa Community Colleges. In Phoenix, Arizona, we are uh, 10 community colleges. Well, actually, 11 now that we have a corporate college, um, and we are in the Phoenix, Arizona area, as Una mentioned. Uh, we three years ago uh, came forward with the Maricopa Millions project, and one of our our, our main goal was to save students five million dollars over five years. Uh, and as you can see by the graphic on the right, each semester, at least each fall and spring semester, we add to the, the tally and the cumulative totals are on the right, each semester are on the left. And we've uh, hit nearly $6 million so far. Just to clarify um, how we do that is we call it no cost or low cost because we figure that's, that's what the students are, are most concerned about. So there are some low cost materials that maybe aren't open that we do can uh, consider as part of the savings for the students uh, that we include in there. So uh, we have been uh, pretty happy with how that's been going and we are, uh, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, looking at establishing a new goal. But how we got going on this project is uh, three of us are the tri-chairs. So this is really, um, as, as others look at projects, I think these are the three main things I really wanted to highlight that I think have been key ingredients for us to be successful. And that is we have multiple 
uh, people working together. Because we're such a large district, it really helps out to have three people working together as tri chairs. We kind of split up the work. Um, and as I'm presenting today, my uh, fellow tri chairs are working uh, uh, diligently on, on some uh, tasks that we need to get completed here by the end of the week. So we, we split up that work and we bounce ideas off each other. And it, it really helps, I think, to move the project forward. Uh, then on a bigger scale, we have a steering team of uh, about 18 or so folks, um, many of them faculty because obviously an, an OER project isn't going to go anywhere unless we have the faculty involved and in, in having some ownership in it. Uh, several administrators, we have uh, vice presidents, so we even have a couple of presidents or right now one president on our steering team that's actively involved. And then we have some uh, instructional support, whether they be instructional designer, uh, somebody from IT, uh, library, of course, involved. And then uh, moving forward, we really can't do much unless we've got some executive sponsorship. So throughout the project, Dr. Maria harper Marinick, who was the executive vice chancellor and provost, or basically our number two person in the uh, district, has been um, a, a great proponent of the project. Just this week, or last week, she uh, was elevated to the interim chancellor uh, position because our chancellor uh, just took a position over at League for Innovation. And uh, she elevated uh, Dr. Paul Dale, who was our president at Paradise Valley, into that position. And I go through all that because I think it's, it's very important to have um, leadership at that level invested in this. And as I'm sure we'll hear from Virginia and some of the other places, that they had similar executive sponsorship that really helped move things forward. So I think that's key to get them involved, um, show them the value in these projects. Uh, so our, our project mainly can be kind of summarized in each semester we go through a new phase. And in each phase, we do a call for proposals. And within that call for proposals, um, we, we ask faculty to uh, give us a, a proposal of how they're going to transform a course from uh, what it traditionally has been into hopefully a completely open uh, course and certainly um, very low cost or no cost depending on maybe if there's print materials. Um, each, each semester, they, they submit those proposals. The steering team looks at them. We try and get multiple colleges working together. We think that makes a richer proposal. We also um, think it helps in scaling later. Uh, and then we, we have the steering team take a look at it um, and provide some feedback. And uh, then we help them uh, through the development process. So as I mentioned, we're, we're in the third year or the sixth phase. So right now we're um, in phase six. We are accepting proposals, and I think the deadline's even today, uh, for this sixth phase. The first three phases, as you can kind of see in the middle of that slide, uh, are the courses that were already approved, piloted, and now we're in the a scaling phase where we're trying to get other folks to adopt it, not only at the colleges they were developed, at, but also across the district. Um, then in the next phases, in the fourth phase, uh, those folks are piloting the courses. And in the fifth phase, they are in the development process. So how do we communicate this to students and to, to others? And we have a filter. And you can kind of see it on the left there where students can check no cost or low cost materials. And then it will search only those courses offered at $40 or less. And then there's a note on the right there that indicates that as well. We also use this to develop reports uh, at the end um, of each semester to determine those savings. I see a question here. I better check. Uh, the funding for the project is ongoing district funding, one-time external funding, a blend. So it has been uh, supported with district-wide funds. Um, so out of our operational budget at the district level, which is why that executive sponsorship was so helpful. Uh, but we certainly um, are looking for external grants to, to kind of blend that. But uh, we've been fortunate enough, because we're a large district, that we were able to do that funding within. Some student feedback. We've got, um, you know, we have focus groups, uh, surveys. And then here's one of our students at Phoenix College talking about not just the cost savings, but having those materials on day one and how important that is. Um, we also have. 
response we get from uh, faculty and administrators, and I'll put this in the chat box in case anyone wants to watch any videos later, a couple minute videos, whether it be from students or, or from um, our president, interviewed several faculty asking them why they use OER um, and, and how that uh, works in their classes. I wanted to mention a couple other things. Uh, you know, we, we talked about the steering team and how important that was in the folks developing, but really without our internal partners, all these different folks to, to get involved. So anybody working on a project, you want to get all these and, and probably more internally involved to uh, make sure that you have the, the most successful project you can. Um, let's see, there's another question. Why would any student not check the box? Yeah. So, um, well, they, they often check it, but then if there's nothing available, then they have to search for it with unchecked. Uh, I wanted to throw in that we have a, a number of external partners. We look to our, our folks that, that are, some will even be speaking uh, later today that we either steal ideas from, collaborate with, uh, communicate with, and of course CCC OER is so helpful in, in doing that. Um, as, as we move forward. Uh, you, you can't do it alone. That's the beauty of OER is everybody's so willing to share. Uh, some data uh, that's consistent with, this is just at one college with math, but it's consistent with what I've seen nationally, and that is students do no worse in success, as you can see on the left. Then the next column shows retention, which is a little bit better, and um, that's consistent. And I see I'm running short on time, so I'll just finish up by saying, what do we need to do next now that we've saved the students money? Well, we're, we're looking at, we have a little OER envy with our folks, and nice segue here into the next folks that are already doing some degrees, and we'd like to offer that also at Maricopa. So without further ado, we'll move on to our next presenter. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, that was really impressive. And on to James, uh, Glapa Gross Clegg. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, boy, it, 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 Paul, Paul is, is very modest about what they're doing at Maricopa. They're, they're, they're so well structured. I, I, I admire what they do, and, and I will certainly say that uh, what we've been able to accomplish at College of the Canyons in a very organic fashion uh, owes to a lot of uh, inspiration uh, by the community, but also a lot of hard work uh, by folks here. But it's, it's definitely more organic. Uh, than what you see in Maricopa. At any rate, uh, I, I, some of you have seen me use this image before, uh, sort of the, the, the lonely long distance runner. You know, you come back from a conference, you come back from uh, a webinar like this, and you think, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring back this great idea. And pretty soon you find yourself, you know, you're, you're just out there on your own, just trudging along. Um, in my case, or in the case of College of the Canyons, we, we came back from a visit to uh, uh, the Foothill Dams, a community college district in 2007, where we had the good fortune of chatting with uh, Barbara Ilowski, who's on the phone here, and uh, Dr. Martha Cantor, uh, former chancellor of that district and a uh, longtime OER champion, uh, who told us about their OER projects and uh, inspired us here at College of the Canyons. Uh, but so, so we knew somebody else out w in the world was uh, working on OER, but uh, still uh, it felt pretty lonely. Uh, fortunately, uh, at College of the Canyons, uh, we've had the long-time support of our chancellor. As, as Una mentioned, the administrative support is very helpful. And uh, in our case, uh, Dr. Diane Van Hook has been a, a true visionary and leader, saying after that 2000 visit with Barbara and Dr. Cantor, this is a social justice issue. Uh, make it happen. And uh, uh, what that enabled uh, on campus was really uh, the permission to experiment and the permission for people to try things. Uh, we are extremely fortunate to have uh, faculty champions, as Una mentioned, uh, who along the way have tried things and, and, and experimented, uh, above all in our uh, sociology department, sociology faculty, and uh, in a career technical education area, water technology and land surveying actually have been early adopters and, and real champions of OER. But we've been fortunate to have both the high level support and the uh, vision and leadership uh, of the faculty. So I'll, I'll underscore and, and support Una's, Una's statement about the importance of, of that uh, leadership. Uh, in terms of expressing a, a, a tightly focused goal uh, in our variety of OER projects at College of the Canyons, uh, 
we have not done a very good job of that, or I have not done a very good job of that. Uh, certainly, uh, I have uh, used all of the arguments you see here on the screen, lower student cost, increase faculty collaboration, reach a total cost savings number for students, and then lo and behold, improve learning. Uh, uh, but I have not done a very good or consistent job of articulating what the focal point is of the variety of projects that our faculty have undertaken. So uh, I imagine that if I had, I'd like to think that if I had done that more consistently earlier on, uh, we would have had uh, more uh, in large scale impact earlier on. So I'll, I'll suggest that as a lesson learned to everybody out there to, to tightly, tightly and uh, consistently define your goals rather than just keeping your fingers, <laughs> fingers crossed as I often do. Uh, one, one thing that has certainly helped make the case on our campus is knowing the numbers, knowing the data uh, from our own students, our, our local situation. We're very fortunate to have a, a powerful institutional research department here uh, who is very willing to collaborate. And uh, so we've been able to collect the kind of data you see here on the screen, uh, asking students what are the top barriers to achieving your educational goals, and consistently, consistently we receive the feedback from the students that, yes, the cost of enrollments and fees is a barrier for about half of our students. Uh, maybe 60% of our students tell us that work pressures are the top barrier, but consistently 75% of our students say that the top barrier to their educational goal is the cost of textbooks and supplies. So uh, having that data at your disposal uh, is, is something I strongly encourage. Uh, there's terrific uh, research uh, that's been done all over the United States so by a lot of the folks on the phone here or on, on the webinar here today uh, that, to which we can point, but certainly having our local data has been helpful to uh, get the attention of, of our faculty. Uh, the other uh, key, key element for, for us has been patience, uh, letting things percolate. Um, it, it, it's uh, uh, funny how, how uh, you know, you can you can talk, or I can talk and talk and talk and talk, and nobody pays attention until they until people pay attention. Uh, I'm very much reminded of of uh, the uh, institutional change or the change management that many of us have gone through in promoting distance learning or online learning. Um, uh, you can demonstrate that there's no significant difference. You can demonstrate that it's uh, cost effective. You can demonstrate that it serves students, uh, but it seems that. There, there comes a time when attention, energies, funding, uh, karma sort of crystallizes. Uh, and, and so I, I do certainly encourage everyone to, to, to be patient. Uh, keep going out. Keep, keep talking. Keep making your presentations internally. Keep directing people to uh, the CCC OER activities. Keep uh, replaying these webinars for everyone on your campus. Keep uh, uh, circulating research briefs. Uh, but one certainly needs to be patient uh, when one is trying to implement or support really significant large scale change uh, uh, in your institution and in the way that uh, uh, that uh, higher education does business. Um, I, I, the next slide uh, shows what has, has changed over time for us at College of the Canyon, Canyons. Uh, this, uh, is an image of, of survey results from, with our faculty last spring, uh, it, during which time we were planning uh, an OER degree initiative uh, to exactly crystallize our efforts, our, again, very organic efforts, uh, bubbling up here and bubbling up there throughout the institution, but not having a focal point. And a, a, a group was planning to, uh, uh, was, was developing a plan around the, an OER degree. Uh, so a survey of our faculty, uh, it was about 25% uh, of our faculty uh, surveyed, told us, lo and behold, uh, this thing that James has been talking about all these years that nobody seemed to want to do, hey, we have been paying attention and this sounds like a pretty good idea. So uh, that's been very satisfying and uh, we've been able to invite a lot of people to, to play uh, this year when we have a, a bit more funding uh, at our disposal. Uh, and I think we're, we're very well poised to uh, invite a lot more people in to play uh, with us uh, as, as, as more funding becomes available. Uh, 
I'll take us back to the persistence uh, persistence uh, idea of the not just patience but persistence, keep it on, keep it on, keep it on, not just waiting, but keep on moving. And uh, I, my experience certainly, and I think uh, I hope that a lot of folks on the on the webinar today would say that uh, uh, being in the OER uh, relay race or being in the OER uh, game feels a bit more like this image today. There are a lot more people out there, and that's uh, really satisfying to know that you're not the only one on the road. Um, but what you can also see here is that they're all heading in a in a particular direction, uh, and uh, uh, what what we've been pointing towards and building towards at College of the Canyons with the um, elements that I mentioned before: the uh, high high level administrative support, the faculty champions, um, uh, marshaling the data, um, uh, being patient, uh, has brought us to a point at which there's really in incredible uh, excitement at the institution and uh, really widespread agreement that uh, implementing a, an OER degree pathway or a ZTC uh, degree is, is just simply the, the, the logical thing to do. Um, many of you know that, all across, that across the United States in the community colleges there's a movement towards uh, degree pathways, period, uh, the sense that uh, community colleges offering smorgasbords of, of course selections to students who are really unprepared and ill-advised uh, to, to choose uh, the, the courses to get to a finish point uh, doesn't do them any, any service. So there is a, a large movement towards pathways overall. Certainly in the California community college system we've been uh, required by law to develop uh, degree pathways. Uh, that provide a mapped out transfer from community colleges to our state university system. Uh, College of the Canyons has more degree pathways than any other uh, community college in, in, in California already developed and have been approved by our local academic senate and state chancellor's office. So we're well poised to expand um, the implementation of OER around already existing pathways. So the ground is fertile. Um, and I suppose I, sh I should, should have added one more slide here uh, uh, emphasizing the ways in which we've been able to use OER to uh, amplify, if you will, the existing student success efforts that we already have underway uh, around uh, completion of pathways and the development of pathways and supporting the, the completion agenda nationally. So uh, with that, I will uh, just to encourage you to, to, to keep on um, keep on the race and uh, uh, identify early on your goals and early on your your focal point uh, uh, so that your uh, uh, structured structured efforts can can bring bring a large scale change sooner than our organic efforts have. And turn it over to the next speaker. All right. Thanks very much, James, um, for those words of wisdom. And um, now we want to turn it over to Quill West to talk about. Um, the Pierce Open Pathway that's been in place now for, I believe, a year and a half, um, which is exactly those OER based or Z degree um, that James was speaking about. Quill? Thanks, Una, and thank you all for giving me an opportunity to, to talk about our Pierce Open Pathway. Um, so, yes, the Pierce Open Pathway is an um, open education based degree pathway to a general education degree. So um, we call it the POC because that's a lot easier to say than Pierce Open Pathway and also because you can market that a little bit better and marketing is not my strong suit so I always choose quick things. Um, for more information kind of to check on some of the things that we're doing you're welcome to visit that URL that's on the screen and I'm going to paste the long version into the um, chat window. So there's that for you. Um, so <laughs> when we started with the POP, um, we uh, were trying to figure out realistically what makes the most sense. So when I came to Pierce College, the, the mission was already to create an open textbook degree. We knew we wanted a degree um, that had your textbook class, mostly because we were losing students. So we knew that we needed to um, eliminate textbook costs in the program that we were dealing with textbook costs in because it was affecting the students so much and they were choosing not to take classes because of the cost of textbooks. 
So um, our pathway is to get on the general education degree pathway at Joint Base Lewis McCord, which is where our degree is right now. Um, they're saving an average of $2,200. Um, but more importantly for us, we really wanted to draw a line. Um, most of these classes, uh, most of the program is an online program, but students have a choice to take face-to-face -face or online classes. Um, and we really wanted to draw a line between course design and textbook selection because um, for us, in particular, there's always that question about is the textbook doing the teaching in an online course? And we know that's not true, but we wanted to really, really showcase that with the faculty that are teaching these online courses. Um, and then I was handed a mission to include information competency and open pedagogy in most of our classes. So um, that was our that's our big push here. Um, so TOF is it's um, it's our general education degree. It's 40 plus classes, and originally it was 32, but it keeps getting bigger. <laughs> um, it's face to face and online. Uh, and our idea here is that students have a choice. So we defined a very narrow pathway that we said this is where we know most of our students are needing to take classes to either further their professional choices or to be able to. Most of our students, well, about um, this program that I'm talking about serves military students and families particularly. So we wanted to be able to help them get promotion points and those kinds of things. So we picked classes specifically that would do that and said to the faculty, these are the classes we're going to do. And the faculty said, OK, we'll do those. And then they did more. So, um, so the pathway keeps getting wider, which is great, but we're still trying to stay on a pretty defined pathway because we worry that too many choices in our gen ed pathway um, leads to too few classes and then we have to cancel classes, we don't want to do that either. So um, we're trying to maintain a pathway that best meets our students' requirements for their degrees. Um, but every one of our open courses is offered every single quarter. So um, students can start on the day one of their pathway and say, I'm going to take these classes and know that we are always going to offer those classes, at least online. Not always face to face, but at least online. So they always have the choice to take the classes. Um, and what that means is that we have to continually keep faculty sharing resources because if one teacher stops teaching, say, um, we have done our um, math and society class. So um, say the teacher who does the math and society class online decides not to teach for us online anymore, we have to be able to give that course to the next teacher we hire, to the next person that takes over the course, because that person has to be able to teach it online. They're open because we've promised the students that will happen for them. So um, it's We've already started to have a tiny bit of turnover between because teachers are changing which classes they prefer to teach. Um, so we've already kind of empowered our adjunct faculty to be able to evaluate courses and make changes to them and teach them as is. And it's kind of a beautiful thing when a new teacher comes on and it's a week before the class starts to be able to say to them, oh, we're not just going to hand you a textbook and say good luck, which has happened in so many adjunct faculty members' careers. But to say, here's a full course and tell us how we can help you to make changes to fit your teaching style. Um, so it's pretty great. Um, and this, um, the faculty or the students have been really positive about this experience because they like having choice. Um, <laughs> so right now our challenge is defining what scale looks like for an entire district. Um, so Pierce College at JBLM is a small part of our entire um, two college district. Um, so what, and it's two colleges, three campuses. How are we going to expand these offerings across the district? That's the question we're dealing with right now. Um, District-wide, our, our strategic plan says that we will have 50% of our courses open um, within the next, I think it's five years. So that's the big vision, um, and that ties very closely to our college mission. Um, so the question then becomes, what are the appropriate courses to expand? And I would encourage anybody who's starting this um, conversation right now at their institution or even people who are far into it to talk to advisors, because I learned the best thing when I sit down with our advising team, who are not necessarily on our steering committee, but I'm reconfiguring that and thinking they should be on our steering committee. 
because they can tell us where most students take the most classes and they can tell us how those classes are better incorporated into the students' future plans so that when we decide which classes to adopt next or when we invest institutional money in adopting open materials for courses, we're doing it in a way that best supports the student choice. Um, so I actually am going to quit talking and turn this over to Preston now, and I will take questions when I'll go back through questions when we come back around. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Quill. Um, that that was amazing. Uh, what you were sharing about how your faculty are working together, and also about how Quill works with students as well. I just wanted to put a plug in that Quill will be talking tomorrow at the same time, same channel here, and she's going to have a student panel uh, join us. So um, do tune in tomorrow if you can for that. And now I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Preston Davis from Northern Virginia College. Um, he's also the VP of our partnerships program at CTC OER. And we've been um, you know, uh, cheering uh, Preston on from the sidelines with his OER-based associate degree for um, three or four years now. And, um, we just love to have him present and talk about the work he's done. Great. Thank you so much, Una. I'm, I'm really happy to be here with, with all of these great colleagues today. And I'm happy to talk a little bit about what we have been doing um, at NOVA uh, to focus on developing uh, OER degree programs for our students. Hello. Um, I'm sorry. Something just happened with my system. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Sorry yep. about that. Well, you're Great. back. Um, I'm, I was having trouble trying to move the slides. Oh, I'm, uh, let's see. Um, you should have access, but um, if you need me to do that, I can. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. So can, can oh, okay. You go. go can I ahead. ask you to do um, the slides for me, Una? Because my my system's not not functioning properly for some reason. Okay, you just okay. let me know when you so, want me to move them. We're perfect. on the first. So, we're on your first. I know that we began building our OER program uh, courses in 2012, and from day one, we had a degree program in mind. Um, so we started by selecting specific courses that we knew would create a degree pathway. Um, we started with a certificate in general studies and um, an associate's degree in uh, general education and also an associate's degree in social sciences. So by selecting specific courses that we knew students could follow to earn a degree, we were really um, helping to uh, encourage students to continue and complete, which is something that community colleges in particular really um, have, have started to emphasize uh, within the last few years. Um, and it was important for us to recognize that um, scaling any OER program uh, requires an emphasis on digital literacy. Um, it's critical for faculty and especially students. Um, millennial students, as digital natives, have a comfort level with technology. And so adjusting to a program that uses digital uh, content and materials is really not something that many of our students have difficulty with. It can be more of a challenge for faculty in some regards. Um, faculty also need to have a desire to share. And that's really not difficult because most educators are in this business because we want to share knowledge and, and help uh, folks grow. And it becomes uh, kind of a natural um, out, out, outshoot of that to, to be able to not only share with our own students, but to um, share resources back that others can make use of as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
We also wanted to make sure as we were taking advantage of all of the digital materials and content that were available, all of the openly licensed materials and more and more of those materials have become available um, certainly over the last year or two. Um, but to make sure that we were not um, missing out on outstanding learning content and resources that are available through our own library collection. And so to fill gaps that may exist in openly licensed content and to make sure that we had the ability to focus on a full and complete program that met all of our learning outcomes, combining openly licensed material as well as the material that were free to our students through our own library collections. We also felt it was very important to develop an organizational structure that supported um, access to materials, um, affordability, and increased student success. And so this framework um, had to have necessary support um, to define the process and to keep the momentum going because this is a lot of work that involves a lot of people. Um, and so we actually incorporated um, reviewing and vetting openly licensed materials in our course design process um, and made sure that we added a librarian as a resource to our instructional design team to help faculty through this process and encourage faculty to incorporate OER. This is part of our ongoing process um, that came out of our initial project. So even though it was a requirement for our OER program that we built, this is something that we um, have incorporated into our process to encourage all, all faculty as they are uh, revising courses um, to try to make as much use of openly licensed material as possible. And we couldn't do this without the help of our friends. We have so many folks in this community that are able to provide support, expertise um, to really share their knowledge, their experience, um, also the bumps in the road that they um, have had to deal with uh, to help us avoid some of the things that um, are, are inevitable when you undertake any type of a project like this. Um, this community is an outstanding community with so many excellent folks and it's also important to be able to give back and to uh, share the content and material that we have and so we're making all of our um, online OER courses available uh, for anyone to be able to adopt and adapt because it's important to share back to the community. Uh, we've benefited from the community and we want to make sure that others are able to benefit from what we've done and our lessons learned. Um, and so the results of what we have done really quickly um, are our degree programs that um, have served over 10,000 students and saved them over one and a half million dollars to date and that's as of the fall. So that doesn't include our current spring numbers. Um, and the increase in student success which is very important to us as well and really the most uh, important thing that we're most proud of is seeing that students who have taken the courses in our OER program um, are seeing better success rates and completion rates because that's really what we were in this business for in the first place. So now I would like to turn it over to my colleague Richard and he can expand more on what we're doing throughout the state of the United States All right. Thank you so much, Preston. Before I turn it over to Richard, I want to apologize. Um, um, Preston's slides were truncated. Um, they will be available later on this afternoon. Um, he had beautiful slides and I, I do apologize for the truncation. Um, and on to uh, Richard who wants to tell us about the statewide work being done in Virginia. Virginia is, is really active in OER right now and um, we, we love to share their, their great work. Yeah, thank you uh, Una and, and thanks Preston and everyone else who's presented today. I'm going to zoom out now. <laughs> um, all the stuff that's been said uh, so far is, is um, uh, probably 
part of um, what some, you know, at least one of our colleges do in this part of what we're calling the Z Times 23 project. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this kind of statewide effort from, a, from, a, from my position here at the system office in Virginia. And it really is, um, you know, kind of, uh, kind of like Preston said, building off of the work that's gone on at uh, Northern Virginia, at Tidewater, and some of our other colleges, and, and really taking advantage of some of the momentum. Um, so we know what a Z degree is, right? It was uh, created by Tidewater uh, Community College 2012, so they kind of uh, launched the, the idea of the Z degree as, as kind of a foundational unit of, of OER that, that, that's really kind of caught people's imagination. Um, and so the Z times 23 project is really the idea of um, taking, you know, that to its logical conclusion, which is you have these um, degree programs in OER that are openly licensed. Uh, that uh, you know, a, a college may create uh, Tidewater, for example, or Nova. That these um, uh, degrees really, the, the you know, need to be shared across the system. And how do you do that? Um, you know, in in concept, it's it seems pretty easy, but but it's not exactly. And you know, there's some challenges uh, with that. And so. Um, but that, that was really the goal of the, the project is to, to take uh, the Tidewater's kind of innovation and this, the work that uh, NOVA did as well and, and, and really kind of share it with our, with our other 23 colleges, which, which we have a history of doing. We have a pretty centralized system in Virginia that, that really, um, I think, um, benefits us uh, in, in scaling these things. Uh, so we got a grant from Hewlett Foundation, um, and we got a, a significant match from our chancellor, and um, I was able to uh, cobble together some other funds. I don't know how, but I did. So, so we're really about a half, a little over half a million dollars for this year-long grant. Um, and uh, so in July, um, really kind of by the time we kind of got the grant, we got everything set up and released an RFP and all that, that process we had. Um, 16 colleges awarded, uh, they could have gotten awards up to $15,000. Um, and so um, what, what that money was used for is including, um, including, included in the grant was technical support. So we had a, a paid um, a program manager, Cheryl Huff, who many of you may know, um, and kind of Lumen support services were part of, of um, the, the grant as well. So colleges needed to, you know, use the money to pay faculty stipends, travel, um, a librarian, instructional designer, it's things that have been talked about before that are important. Um, these, these were all kind of packaged together into a grant that was sent to the colleges to use to launch these projects. And, and in the RFP, uh, you know, there were, there were conditions on it, of course, you know, they, um, had to, uh, and the goal of the, I should say the goal, the cause of the timeline was to, to get started on the Z degree, so they had to build at least 12 courses on their way to the 20 or 21 or whatever to, for the full Z degree. So 12 courses to start that pathway, um, you know, hoping that, that we either get another grant <laughs> the next year or, or there, you know, we'd find some way to kind of finish those off. Um, and have complete degrees. Now, the reason that Virginia, you know, places like Nova and Tidewater and elsewhere are, um, I think, you know, one partial reason for, for the success here is really uh, Chancellor Glenn Dubois. I won't dwell on it. I don't have a lot of time, but he was a community college student. He couldn't afford textbooks, and he talks really uh, compellingly about that experience, and that experience makes him very supportive of, of these issues. I would say this is kind of OER is really his um, uh, kind of a pet project of his. So he's he's um, he is that champion leader that we need. He is putting resources um, where his mouth is, um, and and that's been really it's made a big difference. It's not all you know it, it wouldn't be able to carry this entire project, but it certainly um, is crucial. Um, there's not a whole lot of new money. There's not a whole lot of um, things to develop a new project from scratch. Um, and so, you know, really kind of being creative with adapting, aligning this project, and I can't emphasize this more, aligning it with whatever your institutional strategic goals are, where you already have resources devoted and you can say, hey, this supports, you know, kind of what we're working towards, you know, access and success and, and in our case, completion. Um, and so we're able to get some, some money that, you know, to, to make it part of existing projects um, and, and not say, hey, this is a brand new kind of pilot project that we want to try out and, and really kind of aligning it with other stuff. Um, and we have these trailblazers, you know, we've heard from them um, at, at Tidewater in Northern Virginia. Again, I think it's been a, I mean, 
sometimes it's not such a good relationship between system office and colleges. I think anybody will, you know, uh, I think maybe Preston will attest to that. Sometimes it can be uh, um, a little bit tense. But I think in this case, you know, like being able to support these colleges when I can and also benefiting from their work is, is, uh, is kind of a really great um, partnership. Um, I'm hoping um, you can ask them, um, you know, when I'm not around. Maybe they have a different story. Um, Another really crucial thing, and I, and I know this because uh, sometimes this hasn't been the case and things haven't gone well, is really kind of asking your faculty, you know, or the colleges that are whoever's involved in doing this, is just to do do as much as possible for them and ask them just to take that last step, right? So that support is really essential. You don't want to say this is a good idea and go out and build some degrees and we're all for it and good luck. Um, to actually putting putting some resources there so that they um, they're supported and and are able to take a risk, uh, but it's kind of calculated and it's kind of couched with this other support and they're all in it together. We have some structural advantages um, that um, you know some of my colleagues at other institutions always remind me of. We have a shared LMS. All of our 23 colleges use Blackboard Learn as one instance. So we log in and, and um, everyone sees the same thing. So that's really helped sharing our courses. Uh, it's really just made it um, much easier. Same thing with our SIS system, which people saw. And unlike many um, systems, uh, community college systems, we have a, a pretty centralized governance structure. The most important thing, I think, is that our 23 college presidents are evaluated by our chancellor. So you know, there is a little. Um, both through the technical infrastructure and, and also just through um, kind of personnel level, um, some some uh, ability to scale things that are good ideas. So uh, results again, 16 institutions. Um, we've done uh, they're completing six degree programs that have been targeted. So business admin, management, criminal justice, gen ed, liberal arts, social sciences are the degree that have been targeted by these institutions. Uh, over 100 courses have been adopted, adapted, and adopted um, uh, for for this for this program, and we're being kind of um, integrated. And it's different versions of of similar courses, but but really a really kind of explosion of new OER courses that are uh, available to faculty within Blackboard Learn, and then publicly on Candela uh, and and our Blackboard site. Um, and participation from about, at this point, about 427 faculty members, at least documented, um, that, are, that are participating. And some of the results. Um, and again, this is, uh, the evaluation is still out. We haven't really done a lot of evaluation. But um, fall, about 11, close to 12,000 enrollments using that $100 metric, closing a little over a million dollar savings. Spring, incredibly, about 29,000. Um, uh, enrollments again close to so it's totaling for two semesters about three and a half million um, in saving just just textbook savings within this project and some other organic adoptions. Um, this is really really conservative because we just we don't know the full numbers. Um, and for example, Nova, uh, you know, if you were to count all system-wide stuff like the Nova work, the Tidewater work with the ZLI courses, and, and then other organic adoption that's happening through our uh, Blackboard Learn course site where any faculty member can adopt these courses. Um, lessons learned, set clear goals, align it, and like I said before, align it with your kind of strategic goals. Um, and and uh, you know, kind of make sure the idea here isn't to really build degrees. You know, that's not the end game. It's completion, right? It's got to contribute to our completion agenda. And that's the case, at least at my level, to, to make all the time. Some flexibility. You know, we have rules, but, but, but again, you want to get the colleges on board. You got to, they, they're dealing with some constraints. So, um, you know, I, I try to be as flexible as I can. Um, uh, with, uh, with some of the, uh, the requirements. And reducing friction, really important. Like I said, make it e very easy for faculty. Um, some of the things that have come out of this is our OER course tab. Again, in Blackboard Learn, all faculty members can see this. They can look preview courses, um, and they can adopt courses. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that just from faculty members who just kind of stumble upon it and you know say they like it. And then we have a spreadsheet of all of our courses that are being developed that have led to some kind of interesting collaboration between colleges, which I've been working on for years and years. And, and this is the first time I've seen it really kind of happen this way. Uh, and then model openness. Um, try to have public webinars, share information, share 
our successes and failures. Um, uh, and, and I think that's a uh, that's important too, and, and there's some resources uh, for the slides of some of the some of the things that we've created or some information that you might want to know more about. And then that's it. Thank you, and thank you, Richard. Um, and so we ended right on time. I want to thank um, all our amazing speakers this morning because they each had eight minutes, and um, I think they were all like right on the dot. Um, so to allow you folks out there to have some time to ask some questions. Um, and before we flip to the Q&A slide, I just want to say we do have another uh, webinar tomorrow at the same time. Um, and it will be featuring the Pierce College District uh, students. Um, they'll be talking about OER. And also we will have Northern Essex Community College talking about the faculty development um, that they have done over the last two and a half years, and in general, talking a little bit about what's happening in Massachusetts. So exciting. Join us for that. And um, we, uh, we are open now for questions. Um, I, I did see one question that uh, what, uh, several folks answered in the chat session. Um, it wasn't directly related to this, but it was, um, it was about uh, printing OER. Uh, so get, uh, making that available on campus for students when you need hard copies. And we had some good answers out there. Um, I don't know if any of our speakers um, would like to address that issue. Um, I. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to guess that no. Um, <laughs> um, and great. Oh, thank you, uh, Quill. Quill says create space. Um, we know that a number of folks have used Lulu.com in the past when um, there's an existing PDF um, that can be posted up on on um, Lulu.com by the faculty uh, for free, and then students can print from there. Um, so. Um, Thank you for that. Um, do we have any other questions for our um, speakers? All right. Well, thank you, Amy. Uh, Amy has a question here. Um, she says she likes Quill's question about sharing courses when there isn't a shared LMS. Um, does anyone want to um, share um, success with either course cartridges or other ideas? Um, anyone out there who has been sharing OER without benefit of an LMS? Okay. And my speakers can speak up if you've got microphones. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, LTI or interoperability, okay. um, you know, if you have kind of one of the, mo the more popular LMSs like Desire to Learn, Blackboard, Canvas, you know, there's there's a limited number at, at this point. Um, LTI is, is is something that um, the, the courses, many of the courses, and, and I think eventually most of the courses for this, the, for my project, live on the Candela site, which is Lumen's site, and are kind of piped in through LTI and Blackboard. Um, and so, um, that's uh, that could be done, you know, multiple LMSs. So you can have a canonical kind of version somewhere and, and pipe it in that way through LTI. That, that's one solution. Great, thank you for that, Richard. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great solution. Um, anyone else use any other shared uh, solutions for that? Um, I know in the past there's been some of the big projects have used Google Docs um, to share um, course outlet course actually full full open courses. Um, I think we're probably moving more or moving away from that somewhat. All right, we're at the top of the hour. Any final questions for our amazing speakers? All right. Well, I want to thank Paul, James, Quill, Preston, and Richard who came here to tell you about their successes, their lessons learned, um, and you know what's been really key in terms of ingredients for success and sustainability. 
So I want to, you know, once again thank them and thank you all for coming. And we hope to see you tomorrow um, at uh, the same time for our student panel and faculty development uh, webinar. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, everybody.